Okay, so we are here because you all are part of the 2425 cohort training, or part of the 2425 cohort, I should say. So we're going to go over what that's going to look like. Um, and this is being recorded, so reach out to Julie if you need a copy of the recording. We can, she can get that out to you. And it will also go on the website at some point. Excellent, yes. And here is our team. So my name is Carly Thibodeau and I joined the team almost two years ago. And before that, I was a teacher for 21 years. And with me today is Jennifer. Hello, I'm Jennifer Gleason. Um, like the rest of the team, I was a special education teacher before I joined the team. That was about three years ago. Um, and I'm just waiting for the interpreter to get here. And as soon as she does, I will spotlight her. All right, and Ashley is with us today also. Hi everybody, I'm Ashley Satry. I am the newest member of the team, but I'm coming up on my one year anniversary this summer, so almost been a year. Um, and before I joined the team, I was a special ed teacher here in Maine and in Virginia for 14 years doing kind of a variety of different things, so. Excellent, thank you. And then Colette Sullivan is our federal programs coordinator. And Julie Pelletier is our secretary associate and the keeper of all things. She takes care of us, makes sure that we know what we're doing and where we're going. And we couldn't survive without her, basically. Um, they are busy doing other things, so they're not able to be here with us today. But they are definitely big members of the team. Okay, so like I said, you are all here because you're part of the 2425 cohort which will be going through the audit process through this next school year. Um, and that is outlined in MUSER, that information about um, the whole general supervision and monitoring system um, in the Maine Unified Spe Special Ed regulations. Uh, today, we're going to be going through that audit process. We'll be talking about the self-assessment and go over due dates and um, talk a little bit about the parent and staff survey and then talk about what's next after all that stuff. So this is a lot of information and all of the information you'll also receive in an email in mid-June. So don't feel like you have to memorize anything. And we're always available to contact if you have questions as they come up. So don't stress out if something doesn't make sense. And please ask questions. You can drop them in the chat. We will be checking that as we go. Um, yeah, and we'll, we'll do our best to answer questions as they come up. So as I said, in mid-June, we will be sending out emails to directors um, and you'll be receiving that from your contact person on this team. Now we kind of split them up. So each one member of our team is responsible for certain SAUs. However, if you can't remember who, which one is your contact person, you can reach out to any of us. We will get back to you and let you know who to reach out to or just give you the answer. We're pretty flexible with that. Um, in that email, you will get a copy of this PowerPoint. You will get the monitoring timeline and checklist that we're going to go over. You'll also receive a link to the self-assessment, um, the IEP quick reference document, for 24-25, uh, the professional development schedule, so you know when our trainings are being held and what those topics will be. And you'll also get a copy of our results-based accountability rubric um, that we have been using for the past, for the last two cohorts. So we're going to jump in and go over the monitoring timeline. So you've already received or should have received your letter of notification, which kind of just outlines that you're in that this cohort. Um, we're doing the cohort training right now. Then we're asking that by June 30th, everyone in cohort, please submit two transition screeners. So that's just section nine of the IEP. You do not have to send anything else, just that section nine with that transition plan. And we ask for two of those. And then we take a look at those and just provide you feedback so that if you have a chance to make corrections, um, you can do that before we come to the on site visit to look at those final transition plans. And that is the due date of June 30th for everyone in cohort. 
uh, and you can submit them to our monitoring email, which is written there. Um, this is a secure email. It Only the members of our team have access to that. So that's a good place to send that. Um, you will also be invited to attend our How to Choose training, which will be at the beginning of September. And this year, for a couple of reasons, we have kind of two different timelines for our visits. And you should have gotten your visit date with your letter of notification. So hopefully um, this isn't a surprise to you, but we have two groups. The first group of visits will be in the November, December. Um, and we're asking that the self-assessment for those being visited in November and December be completed by October 1st. And then we also have another group of SAUs that we will visit in April and May. And we're asking that those self-assessments for the April and May visits are completed by March 1st of 2024. You guys, I did it again. I fixed it on the other slide and not this one. Oh, that makes me so upset. It's really 2025, not 2024. I apologize. Um, so yeah, so the self-assessment, if you have a child count of 30 or more students, we're asking that you review 20 files plus one from each out of unit or out of district placement. Then if you have uh, less than 30 students, then you're going to do 10 files plus one from each out of unit. And then if you have less than 10 students for a child count, you'll do all of those files um, plus one from each out of unit. So in Jennifer is going to talk a little bit later about the self-assessment, and but once you enter that data, we get information and then we put it into a PDF document and send it back to you so that you have that information um, going forward. All right. Now, we realize that many of you have switched over to electronic files and we have visited some SAUs that have no hard copy files anymore. They only have electronic and we're seeing that more and more or they're spread out among schools and it's hard to get them to one central location and we're trying to adapt to that. So when we come for our on-site visit, if you have that going on for you, um, obviously access to the full file is easiest for us, but we understand that there are some times when that isn't possible. So if you are able to, please provide temporary access to your vendor as a read only. We don't want to go in and make any changes or anything like that. Just if you're able to do that, that's one option. Um, or if you can create PDFs of the files or the paperwork that we're looking for, and you can email them to us at that monitoring email address. So we have them available on our computers when we come for the visit. That would be another way. Or if you'd like to print and have hard copies, that's fine. We only need one copy of all of the needed paperwork. Um, so, cause we kind of split it up. So we don't need multiple copies, just one copy of each thing. And then these are the things that we will be looking at on site. And it's going to look like a lot of things, but that's because we no longer have those items that we called desk audit items. We are no longer asking you to submit things ahead of time. The only thing we're asking for ahead of time are the B13 screeners and the self-assessment. Everything else we will look at on site, which is we've offered that in the past if you couldn't get them sent to us ahead of time. And now we're just making it our standard practice. So when we come on site, we'll look at those policies and procedures like the child fine, the restraint, seclusion, and the referral. We'll also look at those fund authorization letters um, and then we'll have you sign an accuracy document, which we've always sent out ahead of time, but now we're just doing it as part of our visit. Um, also, when we come on site, we will be reviewing those same files or IEPs that you input into the self-assessment. So if you've had annuals or made changes to IEPs between filling out that self-assessment and our visit, that's okay. We'll look at the most recent or the current um, IEP, written notices, paperwork, that sort of thing. We'll also look at those out of unit files, one from each out of unit, as we're asking for you to put those on the self-assessment. 
but then we'll also be looking for those out of units within the last two years that have been placed in out of unit within the last two years. And we'll be looking at more specific things about that placement process. Then when we come on site, we'll also look at the final transition plans for that B13 piece. And so when we do that, we're asking for a total of 10 transition plans. Uh, and on this timeline checklist, it kind of gives you the paperwork that we'll be looking at if you have to print or, you know, give us just those pieces rather than the full file. We will also be looking at any students that are on abbreviated day during that visit time. So if they are currently on abbreviated day when we come to do the on-site visit, we will be asking to look at those. We will also be looking at eligibility forms. We ask for one speech and language, three SLD forms, three adverse effect forms, three summary of performance forms, and then something that's a new to this cohort is we're looking for three eligibility forms from students that have either been dismissed from services or changed disability category. Um, so those are the forms that we'll look at. And then we are also looking at the initial referrals for child find for that B11. That's another federal indicator that we need to report on. So in this checklist, you'll see that the, these are the components that we will look for as part of that child find for those initial referrals. All right, then we have pre-findings in abbreviated day, if any, for either of those. So this is kind of the what's next, the next steps. After we go through our on-site visit, we will be sending out an email talking about those pre-findings, if there are any or any abbreviated day um, compliance things that need to be uh, finished up. So that is after the on-site visit. And then finally, you'll get your corrective action plan. And if you are part of the November, December visits, your corrective action plan will be issued on January 31st of 2025, and it will be due November 30th of 2025. And if you're part of the April and May visits, your cap will be issued on June 30th, 2025, and due April 30th, 2026. So that is what our timeline looks like. And then I just included the, we will have this available on our website, but these are the dates of all of our on-site visits. And like I said, that should have been included in your letter of notification. So these are the dates. And, all right. And the reason we do all this is because um, there are those Office of Special Ed, Special Education Programs. Um, it's a requirement through the federal DOE. Um, and it's based off of IDEA and Maine Unified Special Ed Regulations or MUSA. Um, and a lot of the changes that you may see if you've been through this process before um, are due to that memo 2301. So we had some uh, changes this summer that came out. One of the biggest changes from 2301, and you may see this or notice it if you've been through this process before, is that we now need to see correction of all of the child-specific correction. So in the past, let's say you had 15 findings for child-specific correction. We would only ask for a subset of that, maybe like five. We would say, you have to fix all 15, but you only need to send us five to show us that you're making those child-specific corrections. Well, in 2301, it specifically says that we need to see all child-specific correction. So if we mark, or if it's noted that there were 15 findings, then we have to ask for correction for all 15 of those findings. So that is a, that is a difference that people will notice as we go forward. Um, okay, so just kind of recap again, all of those B13 screeners are due June 30th, 2024. And again, the B13 screeners are those section nine of the IEP, just the transition plans. That's it. Just send us two of those. 
and we'll give you some feedback about that. And then the self-assessments for November, December are due October 1st. And the self-assessments for April, May are due March 1st, 2025. See, I did change the 2025 here, but not on the other one. Um, everything else is going to be reviewed when we do our on-site visit. So just a little more information about a few of these things. Uh, the first thing is that B13, that's one of those SPP APR indicators. Um, and so we need to report that. That's a federal um, finding and a federal requirement. So we need to report that information to OSAP. <clears throat> and so we look at ages 16 and older, even though Muser asks for 16 or ninth grade. Um, it's 16 and up and no seniors. Okay, because if they were seniors, they'd be graduating, and then there wouldn't be, there would be no child specific correction if there were things that need to be corrected. So that's why we ask for no seniors. All right, and again, please send in those two screeners, that section nine only, to our monitoring email by June 30th. And then we'll give you that feedback. And hopefully, um, that will give you time to make corrections if there are any non-compliant pieces, because when we look at this, we look at different pieces of the transition plan. However, if one piece is non-compliant, the entire transition plan has to be marked as 0%. So it's either zero or 100%. It's very frustrating for us, but that's how we have to report it out. So we look at each piece and give you feedback about each of those pieces. And if you're able to make corrections, that would be great. Because if you make those corrections before our on-site visit, that means fewer CAP findings. And this also goes for the self-assessment as well. So if you do the self-assessment for your IEPs and you go through and you are like, oh, this is non-compliant. And let's say an annual comes up, you are able to change that. And then when we come on site, we look at the most recent IEP and we can change that from a no to a yes. All right, and then, okay, and we, I talked about this a little bit, but before the transition plans that we looked at were based on child count, the number of transition plans. Now we just have a set number of 10. We are asking for 10 final transition plans when we come to our onsite for our onsite visit. If obviously, if your child count does not allow for 10 transition plans, then we'll work with you. Um, and when we're on site, in that checklist, it tells you what we will need to see. We look at the advanced written notice, the written notice, and then the, I, the full IEP, because we look at section five, the goals, and section nine, the transition plan. Um, and again, just another reminder, 16 and older, but none graduating in June of 2025. So just a one pager of what we look at for those transition plans. Um, we look at the advanced written notice, to look that the purpose of the meeting is checked off and that the child was invited to the meeting. Then we look for, we look at 9G to see if there are any agencies involved. And if there are agencies involved, we look for that consent to invite that outside agency. Because if an agency is involved, they must be invited by the SAU. So there should be a parental consent form in there, whether it's signed by the parent or if it's not signed, um, it still should be dated. We look at the written notice to make sure that there's discussion in the written notice that the transition plan has been updated at least annually. And then on the transition plan, we look for those transition assessments, those goals for education, training, and employment, also independent living if it's appropriate. We look at the course of study, the transition services, and then we look at the alignment between the goals in section five to the post-secondary goals on the transition plan. Okay, I know there's no chat box check-in, but any questions about all of that? A lot of information that I just gave you. Nothing in the chat so far, Carly. Okay, excellent. So now Jennifer is gonna talk about the self-assessment. 
I am. I'm sorry. Um, the the um, the interpreter is having trouble getting on the Zoom, so I'm just kind of watching a couple screens here, but it's okay. Do you want, do you want me to keep going, or I, I might throw to you. We'll see. Okay. All right. I'll be here. <laughs> okay. All right. Self assessment. Um. So. Carly talked about how many files to look at. We just want to point out that you should um, spread those across disability categories. Make sure if you have um, students with multiple disabilities that you have at least one of those um, across ages, case managers, ethnicities, um, kind of representative of your school, right? All the different, um, everything. Um, like Carly said, please do not send graduating seniors because um, you won't be able to fix them. Um, so again, if you have 30 or more students, you're going to do 20 files, less than 30, 10, less than 10, all of your files. We also ask that you review one student from each of your out of unit partners. Um, and when we come on site, we will wanna look at all students who have been placed within the last two years. And for those, we just look at the um, placement process. We won't look at their IEPs. All right, so for those of you, there's quite a few, I see a lot of familiar names here. For those of you that have been through this process before, hopefully you're going to be very happy about this, but that horrible EMT spreadsheet you used to have to do for your self-assessment is no more. Well, it is, but we only we have to look at it. We don't make you look at it anymore because it's brutal. So what we did is we made a form for you to fill out looks just like this. This is last year's. So you just put in your student information, go through the form. It goes through the IEP from top to bottom, um, all the information, and then it starts going through each um, indicator. So it tells you exactly what makes this, it, well, at the top, it tells you what section you're looking at because that's important. So section 4A, it tells you what makes it compliant, and what makes it not compliant. So you pick yes or no. If you choose no, that little box at the bottom will pop up and you can um, just put in a little note why this was non-compliant. Um, if you put yes, it won't give you that little box. At the end, it will give you the option to save your responses. The responses will get fed automatically into a spreadsheet. So when you get your link, share it. Share it with case managers, share it with your IEP coordinators, whoever's gonna help you with this self-assessment process that shouldn't really fall all on one person. And as many people as you want can have this link and it will all go into your um, spreadsheet. So it'll go into a spreadsheet and then we will download it into the EMT for, so that when we go on site, um, we have your, information there that you put in. We will also, once all of your files are in there and we download it, we will send you um, a sheet that has the student, everything that you said no, and the reasons you put in there for no, why it was not compliant, so that you have that list. Um, and if you have any students that have annuals between the time you do the self-assessment and the time we come on site, you can check that list against their new IEP. And then when we come on site, we'll change all those minuses to pluses for you because they'll be all good. All right, any questions on that? There's nothing in the chat. All right, Carly, I'm gonna throw back to you for a little bit. Okay. Sorry. That's okay. <laughs> See, this is why we need Julie. This is how much we rely on her. Um, okay, so during that on-site visit, these are the things that we'll be looking at. We'll be looking at those student files, the B13, the B11, the B13 of those transition 
um, plants. The B B11 are those uh, initial evaluations, summary of performance, eligibility forms, abbreviated day out of unit placements. We'll bring the accuracy document for you to sign saying that your documents are all accurate. Um, and we'll look for those fund authorization letters and the policies and procedures. So when, <clears throat> when we come on, we look at the same files as the, as the self-assessment or that you completed as part of the self-assessment just to verify those findings. Um, and when we do this, we really look at this as professional development. If you're able to have your staff there, we know that it's a hard time right now, getting subs, getting time for staff to be available to come out and sit with us. But if they are able to, um, we provide contact hours for that time. Um, and it really is, we've, we've heard many times, this was the best, you know, professional development. We learned so much because they're able to sit there with us and go through an IEP. Um, and even if it's just being able to go through one, they don't have to go through all. Uh, just being able to sit and hear that feedback is always, we've always had heard good things from that experience. Um, we also visit programming if that's possible, if you have programming that you would like us to take a look at. Uh, it's not anything we have to do. We will also take a look at that transition programming. We'll look at the process documentation for abbreviated day and same with the out of unit. We look at that process for placement for those students placed in an out of district or out of unit placement within the past two years. And here we go again. We'll look at those policies and procedures for a child fine, restraint, seclusion, and referral. We'll have you sign. We will bring the accuracy document and have you sign it. Um, those fund authorization letters, we'll take a look at those. Make sure you have those for staff that are authorized to commit funds. Look at those eligibility forms along with the summary of performance forms. And that other federal indicator that I talked about is B11. That's that indicator for initial referrals. Um, and this is a report that we also have to report to OSEP and it's part of the SPP APR. Um, and it's looking at the 45 school day timeline for initial evaluations, part of that child find piece. And along with that, we look for procedural safeguards being given at the point of first contact, which is when that initial referral happens. So it's very important to document either in your advanced written notice of that very first initial referral meeting before any evaluations are completed. It's some people call it a step one meeting. Some people, it's just that meeting where they talk about those, those evals that are going to be completed. Um, so either documenting it in the advanced written notice as an enclosure or in the written notice as an enclosure or as part of the document itself. Um, or if you are sending out a consent with a written notice, a consent for evaluation with a written notice without a meeting, you can put it on that written notice or even on the consent to evaluate as an enclosure. But it has to be within that initial before the eligibility meeting um, to be compliant for that point of first contact. That child find for the initial referrals is just make sure you include a copy of the school calendar, including snow days and no school days or no student days so that the 45 calendar days can be counted out if it's usually close to that timeline. Um, it and make sure that the school calendar is available for whichever school year you're giving those initial referrals from. Some of you, it will be from the 24-25 as it comes up. Some of you may need to use initial evaluations from 23-24. So just please have those school calendars available. So we asked for 10 initial referrals as part of this. Um, and so we look for that pro the uh, consent form for evaluations from when it was received in the SAU and then to the eligibility meeting being within 45 school days. And um, 
what was I going to say? Oh, and we look to make sure that all of the evaluations were completed. So we look for the first page of each evaluation to make sure that the evaluations noted on the consent form were completed. That's what I was trying to say. Okay. And then if they're not completed within the 45 school days, there are some reasons that are acceptable and there are other reasons that are unacceptable. So just make sure that you are thinking about these when you're going outside that 45 school days. And we understand that because that very first one on unacceptable is lack of personnel. Um, and we, we know that's a huge issue right now. Um, however, this is from OSEP and they still count that as unacceptable. <laughs> so unfortunately, um, so yeah, so just do the best you can with that. We know everyone is struggling with that. The summary performance form, uh, you again will either be submitting, depending on which visit time you're at, you may have some from the 24-25 school year if you're in the later set of visits, but if you're in the beginning visits, you'll probably have to use ones that were from this school year. So we are looking for three summary performance forms, um, just making sure that they're completed, they have those recommendations, and that information from for academic and functional is included on those forms. Again, the eligibility forms, we are looking for the three specific learning disability eligibility forms, three adverse effect, and one speech and language. And then any three eligibility forms from students that were dismissed from services or changed disability category. And just a little one pager reminder about what we look for on those eligibility forms. Make sure there are no blank boxes on these forms. Uh, your verification must include data. And that goes for whether you check yes or no on those forms. So if you're filling out an eligibility form and it is yes, include data, verification with data. If it's no, include verification with data. Um, except for that adverse effect, when NA means not available, you don't need to put anything if you put NA. And include the severity rating scales with the speech and language eligibility forms. Those must be included. All right, and Jennifer says she can hop back on, so I'm gonna let her take over again. Thanks, Carly. Thanks for jumping in. Um, the accuracy document we will bring with us, hopefully we will remember, and we will have you sign that, just saying that the paperwork we looked at is a reflection, an accurate reflection of your um, procedures. And we will look at your fund authorization letters. These are the letters from the superintendent giving whoever they give the um, authorization to commit funds on the behalf of the SAU. Um, separate letters for each person, please. That's it, yeah. We'll look at your policies, referral, child find, and restraint and seclusion. Um, you should be updating your restraint and seclusion policies based on the new chapter 33. And I'm hoping this summer to have um, a model for you on that. We do have models for child find and referral, if you would like. Um, abbreviated day, we will look at all of your students who are on an abbreviated day. Um, this is one of those places where MUSER is really specific about the documentation requirements. Um, this link will bring you to our abbreviated day module that goes through all that. Um, these are the things we look for. I think I'm not going to go through in detail. Um, it's a lot. I will say, though, that um, there are two reasons to put a child on an abbreviated day. It is the child's individual educational needs or the child's individual medical needs. And on the IEP, your LRE percentage, either way, should be based on a full school day, not on that partial day. So those are the requirements for educational. These are the requirements for 
medical, and we will go through this in more detail in the how to choose your IEP training in September. Or you could watch the abbreviated dead one. Um, I think in November, we should get the certification report. And if you get flagged for certification errors, you will get an email from your member, from your team member, giving you all the details on that. If you don't get an email, then no news is good news in this case. Um, typically, what happens sometimes if um, the wrong position gets selected on NEO in the dropdown, that might be, you might have to just go into NEO and fix that. Um, the report cross-references NEO with the certification system, and they were not built to talk to each other. So sometimes the report isn't 100% accurate. So if um, t staff pops up that you know are certified, it it's probably just a communication error between the two systems. So if you could just um, do a print screen from the certification system to let us know that that person is indeed certified. That will take care of that. Parent surveys, Julie will send these out at the beginning of the school year in August. Um, it is open for the whole school year. She provides a link and a QR code. So if you want to share those at IEP meetings anytime, Keep sharing them. If you meet the end size, which is five, you will get your district specific results next summer. If you have fewer than five, then you will get the results for the entire cohort. And that's for confidentiality reasons. The staff survey, Julie will send you a link and a QR code for that with your confirmation email about one month before your on site visit. So you can share it with your staff and same thing and size is five. So if you get at least five, you will get your district specific results. Typically the results go out in August, maybe September. It depends on the data team and how fast they're moving. I was gonna say, I think they were more like November this year, but. Were they? Oh, yeah, they oh. were late. All right, any questions? Or is everybody just too hot and tired? Nothing in the chat. Um, what is in the survey? It's, it's questions. Um, the staff survey we have to look at because we get a lot of feedback that it's really geared toward case managers. So it's harder for administration and ed techs to fill out because some things don't apply to them. So we are going to look at that. The parent survey. Um, the important thing is that we have to report to OSET about how the percent of parents will report that the school facilitated parent involvement. So there are questions that kind of lead us to that answer so that we can report it to OSEP. Um, Mary Ellen, it could be either. You're, like all, for all of them, we can use initial referrals for, if you use them for your self-assessment, that's fine. The transition plans, you can overlap whatever makes sense to you to overlap. Um, our goal is to make this as easy as possible for you. Um, yeah, self-assessments use, um, use the current IEP and the only restriction is don't use um, students who are going to graduate in 2025 and kind of a well-rounded group of students. I don't have example questions, Erica, and I don't have access to it, um, but I can ask Julie how that works. I'm not sure if she even has the capability to do that, but I'll look into that. And with that, on to Ashley. Okay, stay with me, guys. We're almost done. This is the last few slides. Um, so we will talk about next steps after the on-site visit. So we've made it through the on-site visit and had a big sigh of relief after we've left. Uh, 
And so we will compile all of our information and then you will receive a follow-up email within a few days after our visit that has the following things. Um, you'll get your pre-findings and abbreviated day findings if appropriate. Um, that will depend on what we see while we're there. Um, and there's a shortened timeline of when those are due. If you have pre-findings or abbreviated day findings, we'll get into the specifics of those as it gets closer. Um, and those are due within 30 days of when we issue them. And you'll also get a copy of that results-based accountability rubric that Carly referenced earlier. Um, this will just be the blank copy that has the steps on it. It won't be where you fall on the rubric. It's just um, to give you kind of the details of what we're looking at um, because without getting too far into the weeds here, if you do correct your pre-findings, it can change your placement on the rubric. Um, so again, that will be explained afterward a little bit more, but it just gives you an idea of what we're looking for. And there will be a copy of the IEP quick reference document to be able to reference um, as you make your corrections. And we'll talk more about that in a minute too, the quick reference document. So after the pre-findings uh, timeline, which is that 30 days after our on-site visit, we will then take that information and we will issue your corrective action plan. So for SAUs that we visit in November through December, your corrective action plan or your CAP, which we'll say all the time, uh, will be issued to you on January 31st, 2025 and your placement on that tiered rubric. And the corrections to that CAP will be due on November 30th, 2025. Uh, and then for the other section, for the SAUs that we'll visit from April to May, your corrective action plan will be issued on June 30th, 2025, along with your placement on the rubric, and that will be due April 30th, 2026. Every time I see that 2026, <laughs> I, uh, go ahead, Jennifer. Can I add one thing, Ashley? Yep. Um, just for the people that have been in cohort before, Again, with the EMT, we used to send you the EMT with the CAP and many other documents that you had to cross-reference and figure out which student had which finding. We're not going to do that anymore. That's going to be much easier as well. Okay. So um, outside of after you're issued your CAP, you'll be submitting your evidence to close that CAP. And when you're submitting that evidence, if you can please clearly label that evidence for what the correction is. Um, and if you have any questions about the self-assessment, you can reach out to, the, to your point person or any of us, like Carly said, we will all answer and or direct you to where you need to go. Um, so just making sure that you're labeling that correctly. And here's where you will submit that evidence to. So we have our secure uh, email box, which is that monitoring.doe at main.gov. And if you'd like to mail it in, you can mail it in to Julie at the address there. Um, and it just takes a little bit longer if you mail it because we have to get it in and scan it and all that stuff. But um, that is a perfectly acceptable way to submit your evidence. And so those are the highlights to submitting your evidence after your corrective action plans which leads us to what you can do between now and all of that. Um, we've got some great trainings that we're offering. So um, in preparation for the monitoring process, you can uh, attend the How to Choose Your Appropriate IEPs for Your Self-Assessment, which is being done on September 18th. We're offering that at 9 and 3, depending on if that works for your schedule, and it's recorded. So if you can't make either of those, you can access the recording. Um, and then. We have our B13 training scheduled for October 31st, and that's from 9 to 11.30. That's going to go over all of those transition plan transition plans, um, everything you need to know about that. And there's one more, uh, the IEP training um, scheduled on October 15th, and that is from 9 to 11.30. Again, all of those will be recorded and put on the website if you can't make those times, but you can register um with Julie and those are great um professional development opportunities too for you and your staff 
if you have time. Um, and then we have a, just a couple of resources to go over. So as you guys are well aware of the procedural manual, here's the link to the, to the procedural manual, which goes into detail to fill out all those forms and everything else. Um, we've got Muser. There's, these links would be live in the um, PowerPoint, but also on our website. Um, a little more dense, but has all the information you need. <laughs> And then my very favorite, so this is the IEP quick reference document. I use this thing all the time as the newest member of the team. This is the 2324 um, cohort. So this is what we were looking at. It has all the findings we look for. It tells you where in the IEP to find them. It uh, cites Muser, why we're looking for them. And then it gives you the criteria of what we're looking for in each of those sections. So it takes the guesswork right out, um, tells you what we're looking for. And you will get the updated one for 2024-25. Um, but if you just can't wait, you can always access that one on our website. <laughs> um, and then we just have our resources from the DOE websites. We've got our professional development calendar, um, the recordings and PowerPoints from previous PD and office hours. We've got other resources, laws and regulations, and forms of reporting. And if you guys have any other questions, we have a little bit of time for questions. Um, and then we are all done. Uh, if you'd like to scan the QR code there or go to that link, and Carly just dropped the link in the chat, this is feedback for this presentation, and we'll give you a contact hour. Um, we like feedback, and we try to incorporate it into our development of our um, PowerPoints and professional development. So please fill that out if you have time. Here are all the social media links for the main Department of Education. You can find them on every platform possible. Um, and then just our email addresses. If you have any questions, you're welcome to contact any of us on the team. Um, and I think if you scan that QR code, it takes you to our bios or something. Yep. So I think that's it if there are no questions, we can, everybody can have a few minutes left back of their afternoon and go home 13 minutes early. <laughs> I'm sure it's been a long day. <laughs> All right. Jennifer and Carly, any last minute? Nope. All right, thank you everybody for coming.